All right. Welcome to our podcast number 12. Today we are going to be talking with Paul Vargas. He is the the brains behind the Pontiac Fiero price guide that uh, is uh, published every year through Fiero Focus. So um, before we get dive into that, I uh, just want to say thank you to everybody who joins us in our podcasts. I really do hope that you guys like them. We've been getting some positive feedbacks on these. So if you have any ideas or comments or different topics to talk about, please send them our way and we'll get them on our list. So right now we've got uh, in the works, uh, future podcasts are the ladies of knife. What is life really like with a fear hobbyist? The original owners group, the uh, Christian Sass, we're going to talk about Fear Focus uh, and the design and the illustration of that. We're going to talk with Matt from the Fear Store. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, NIFE's prize show Fiorama and how that's come about over the last 25 to 26 years. Uh, we're going to talk with uh, V8 Archie and, and how he got started with the V8s. We're going to have a conversation with the Midwest Fiero Clubs and probably going to be a, a four-parter. Uh, we're going to talk prototypes with uh, Fred Bottermeyer. So uh, you can find all this, uh, these future ideas and past podcasts at fearfocus.com. Uh, we also have a blurb in Fear Focus magazine and on our two Facebook pages, <clears throat> at Knife Club and at Fiorama. So let's uh, go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome, Paul. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate the time to um, offer some of my opinions about the price guide. Thank you. So how long have you been a part of the FIRA community? Well, actually, I uh, pretty much joined it in the um, fall of 1993. It all started when in Money Magazine, there was an article about the uh, collector cars that you might want to keep over the years. And number 10 on the list was an 88 Pontiac FIRA GT. So um, when I saw that, I was kind of in the market for a used Corvette. So I thought, well, this makes a lot of sense. A uh, lot lower price, still two-seater, uh, sports car. Um, so I started immediately uh, looking for uh, a Fiero. And I find, found one in September of 93. It was an 88 red GT automatic. And it was with the help of our club president, Jim Holman, after I found him to uh, went out and looked at the car and, and bought the car and at the same time joined the, uh, the NIFE Fiero Club. I was member number 71 at that time. So that's kind of started the whole uh, issue of being in, in the Fiero community back in 1993. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I joined in 97. So yeah, it's time flies. I mean, it seems like yesterday too. <laughs> Yeah, it does. Um, how many how many Firos have you had over the years? Well, I don't know what the current number is, but it was someplace in excess of uh, 150 wow. that uh, I have bought. And of course, keep in mind that this now has been a 30 some year. Uh, let's see, it's uh, 20 and seven, so 27 years of uh, being in the Firo community. So I've had a lot of time to do all of that. So after I bought that first one, um, I got pretty intrigued with it and quickly found a, a second one that I could completely dismantle. It was a Florida car that had a lot of, uh, it was a T-top car actually, but it was full of sand in every corner. So I took it home <laughs> and literally <laughs> tore it apart and to kind of get an idea of how every part fit, where every part went. And that's how I kind of learned a lot about the Fiero. So after that, it was just a matter of uh, being involved with the community, being involved with uh, things like Pennox Fiero Forum, talking to people, and then eventually people would call once in a while and say, hey, I've got this Fiero for sale, are you interested? So, you know, it just kind of snowballed from there and uh, rose exponentially over the years. So, but uh, I've had just about every model Fiero, I guess there is, uh, I have not owned a, a Zimmer, which is you know, kind of questionable whether it's a Fiero. <laughs> but um, I, have owned, I, I have owned a Mira, and I have owned pace cars, and pretty much every model car, uh, every model of the Fiero that was made. Wow. And, and you were dubbed Mr. Fiero, too. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. At one time, uh, that's what I was called. I was on the cover of one of our magazines, uh, standing in the T-top of my '88 Formula car, and um, whoever did the magazine at that time thought that I should be called Mr. Fierro because I was so deeply involved with <laughs> the number of cars that I bought, the number of people that were contacting me, not much uh, information I was giving out about the car. Uh, so somebody dubbed me Mr. Fierro. It's kind of stuck over the years, although. There are people out there now that probably are, are are more attuned to being called Mr. Fierro than I am. You you currently have an '88 uh, T-top VHET. Uh, you still love driving that and and taking it all over the place. Yeah, I do. I've had the the VHET for about eight or ten years now, and actually, this is my third one. I actually started with a, a Formula a V8 and then moved up to a Formula T-top V8 and then to the uh, GT V8 with the uh, Corvette engine in it. So I still enjoy it. It's still a fine car, still run the road. It was a brand new engine, did a lot of work to the car, all new suspension, brakes, upgrades, just exactly like I wanted. I never built it. People always say, well, what will it do in the quarter? And I keep telling them I didn't build it to take it out onto the track. I built it for pleasure and enjoyment to drive it around. So, and that's still true today. Nice, nice. Um, not only do you do the Fear of Price Guide, but you also write an article in Fear of Focus called Paul's Product Reviews. Do you like testing and reviewing new products that come out? Well, the whole idea is to bring products uh, to the Fear community that maybe some people don't know about or that are new to the community where people just haven't realized these products are available. So I, I'm on the lookout always for something new and different by many of our vendors. And uh, so I go to them and say, do you have some new products? Is there something they want me to take a look at, review it? And in many cases, be able to take a sample of it and test it. So uh, I hope that provides a little information with you to the Bureau community of what's really available out there. Is it, um most of the stuff that you you see and test and review is it more of restoration parts or modification kind of style parts it, it could be either but the uh, restoration parts are probably 50 percent, and then uh, upgrades and, and various things let's say upholsteries and and things like that uh, but most of it is uh, just replacement of original equipment with something that performs better and will last longer. Okay. Awesome. And um, we do have um, past uh, Paul's product reviews on fearfocus.com. So if anybody's interested in some of those past reviews on, on parts and stuff, you can always go to the website and check them out. So everyone's heard of Rodney Dickman. Everybody's purchased parts and other things from Rodney Dickman. But did you know he now has brand new undercarriage coolant tubes? Well, let's give a little backstory. The replacement undercar coolant tube story started back in 1984 when the Fiero first hit the streets. Some Fiero owners eventually needed a replacement undercar coolant tubes. Many times the problem started at the repair shops. They put the pads under the tubes and as the car was lifted, it dented and or crushed most of the tubes along as it was being lifted. After they were no longer available from GM, if they even ever were, one could only search for a good one at a junkyard or somebody else who has some of the parts. Good used ones could be found, but if you did, they were too large to ship. The post office, FedEx, UPS, wouldn't even ship them, not even Greyhound. Another problem was the undercarriage corrosion under the clamps. A big problem in the 84 to 87 was that they go up and over the front suspension. Even if you put the 84 87 up on the rack, you still had to maneuver around the front suspension. Sometimes you even had to remove the front suspension. So Rodney Dickman had been asked many times over the past 20 plus years for replacement coolant tubes. His response was, I was always told the same thing. Good ones 
and used ones are out there, but they're too big to ship. So fast forward to today and you will still find that good ones are now very difficult to find. And when you find them, still hard to ship. So the only idea that Rodney Dickman had was he contacted a few Fiero people that have worked on parts and or parted out Fieros. They talked and all these new under car, car coolant tubes, they told them these tubes are generally never damaged where they bend inward behind the front wheels and go forward. The damage is always along the sides and the back. So Rodney Dickman developed these repair, repair kits. You can cut your existing tubes and install this 304 stainless steel repair section. So this thorn in everyone's side now on these coolant replacement tubes is now a thing of the past. To order one, you can visit www rodneydickmanaccessories.com try them out i guarantee you won't be disappointed all right well let's uh dive into the fear of price guide uh, when did uh, the first fear of price guide debut actually it debuted in 1996 so it's about um, oh, wow. 20 24 years old now i start putting it together right after i bought my first couple of Fiero, just to get an idea of what cars are selling for because I was so actively involved with buying and selling that I had a good history of what was going on with Spiro's um, uh, that were for sale and, and what they actually sold for. So I really started the price guide uh, back in that time. So initially I, I came up with the prices, uh, it took me maybe six months or a year to keep watching the market, uh, making calculations, uh, posting things to Excel spreadsheets of what I've seen, and then kind of just putting it together in a conglomeration of what I felt was going on in the marketplace at that time, and then watching what was going on in the marketplace that would support the kind of prices that I put in there. So um, I, I used as references, um, of course, Spiro, uh, Panax Spiro Form, which is still pretty popular about selling cars, but certainly uh, things like Kelly Blue Book, um, Craigslist, uh, eBay, Auto Trader, Cars.com, all of those sites I was very involved with watching on a regular basis and subscribe to them. And as you know, in many of those sites, you could subscribe and say, whenever a Fero comes due, you know, send me an email or send me a link and you, know, you can go look at it. Probably the most difficult part has been to determine exactly what cars are sold for as opposed to what they're listed for. But I've, I've worked through that uh, through the years and I, I feel fairly comfortable uh, of where I put the prices in, in the guide. Did you see a lot of uh, fluctuation between those reference points? Kelly's Blue Book, um, Penox, Craigslist, eBay, stuff like that? Yes, probably so. <clears throat> probably the lowest price cars I've seen were came out of eBay uh, and, and Penox. Kelly Blue Book and Auto Trader and, and Cars.com uh, typically price cars higher and many cars on those lists were from dealers as they are today by the way you can go really? to auto trader now and find heroes listed for anywhere from ten to twenty thousand dollars but most all of those are dealer cars who they claim are pristine and of course that would be you know pretty questionable even though they have pictures on the site and they, they talk about them and they're 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 touting those as a uh, collector type car and, and appealing to people who might look for something that's a collector car at a lower price. But yeah, you, you typically can find the higher prices on, on detail, uh, retailers, dealers, lots. Interesting. Uh, as, opposed, as opposed to going to the forums where people are actually selling cars. Interesting. What, um, uh, what does the price guy consist of just 84 to 88 Indies? Do you also include Mira's and Zimmer's in there as well? All, all the cars are shown in there every year and every model, and uh, including the Mira. The Zimmer is not. It's such a, a unique, different car that I, I kind of consider that a completely different category. The Mira is almost a different category, too. But uh, since there, there were oh, a couple hundred Mira's that were actually made, 
uh, I did include them in the price list. And I do kind of watch mirror prices, although there's not very many of them sold and traded anymore. But all the other the, the makes and the years are in the price guide. And the price guide not only shows the model name, but it shows the number that were produced in that particular year. Um, and then the price guide certainly has the, the total of years that were uh, that were built at a little over 370000 for the year. So that's all yeah. in the price guide. We know how hard it is to find Fiero parts. We also know that as years go by, finding parts isn't going to get any easier. The big box stores will never make new Fiero parts because our community is just too small. This is why we need to support the companies that support us. For nearly 30 years, the Fiero store has sponsored our club events, provided free technical support, and produced well over 150 exclusive parts that no big box store would even consider. So, next time you need Fiero parts, head over to the FieroStore.com and browse through thousands of products that are specifically designed for your Fiero. That's FieroStore.com, the world's largest source of Fiero parts. Um, do you consider the Fiero a, cl a collector car? In my after, personal after opinion, redoing all or looking at over this all this yeah, information, in, in my personal opinion, I, I, I'm not calling it a collector car. I think it's considered in in the marketplace a specialty car. Uh, they're referred to as collector cars because that terminology, I think, by dealers and, and a lot of people who sell them, um, you know, claim that 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 nomenclature. Uh, involves a, a higher price because you call it a collector. But uh, I don't see the collector car as if you start looking at auto auctions these days and you look back at some of the old um, Mustangs and Camaros and Firebirds that, that truly represent some of the collector car market. I don't think the Fiero is in that category at this time. And it, it may be well in that category someday, but my personal feeling is calling it a collector car is, is not exactly right. Would classifying it more as an antique? In, well, I don't think so. Of... I, I, no, I don't think antique. I, I still think it's just a specialty car that uh, some people like the idea of it and some people like the looks of it. So um, I think that's about as far as it goes. I, I, I don't see it as an antique car, even though you can get antique plates in most states these days. Okay. Do, do you see some models have a higher value than others? Well, of course, um, as I point out in my price guide, the uh, 88 cars, because of the suspension changes, I have more value than the previous year cars. Uh, however, the um, 87 GT, the 86 GT, and to some degree the pace car uh, have some value to them because in cases of the, uh, even the 85 GT through 87 GT, there are a lot of components you can add to that car. They're all V6 cars. And you can, you can make them a well handling car, even though the 88 handling surpasses all the previous year's cars. So, yeah, I think the top car that everybody still wants is the 88 GT. There are only 6,500 of them made. They're still being traded at, at pretty darn good prices. And um, there's still enough of them around. But uh, also there's, a, you know, as far as GTs are concerned, even in 87, there were like over... 15,000 made in 86. There are over 20, 26,000 of them made. So there's a, uh, there's, I mean, 17,000. So there's there's a lot of 86, 87 GTs on the market, which can be upgraded suspension-wise and uh, uh, component-wise and engine-wise that make them still a fine car. I'm going to throw a little curveball here. Do you think color also plays a price? I, I do think color plays a price, even though the market will tell you that the color doesn't make any difference. It's just like saying, is a manual transmission better than an automatic? So yeah, color, especially where there are low quantities made, you know, as an example, the 88 yellow car, the 87 uh, blue car, you know, those are colors that were made for one year. And, and in my opinion, they do demand a higher price. 
I have not put anything in the price guide for color at this point in time, just be another column to try to figure out if color to make a difference. But my, my guess is that, that the color could be worth uh, easily 10% more in value than, than the price guide or, or the price that you'd pay for a different color car. Okay. Kind of piggybacking off of uh, the collector car question, do you see that it's still worth continuing to drive the Fiero daily, store it, or keep it as a low mileage car? Yeah, I've, al I've always said right along, un unless it's a unique low mileage car, I mean, I can't imagine taking a uh, 85 Sport Coupe and, and putting it in, in a plastic bubble in the hope someday that you'll be able to triple your price. So the answer on most all cars is, I think once you get over, let's say 5,000 miles, maybe even 10,000 miles, you know, might as well keep on driving it because you might as well get some enjoyment out of it. We have seen the prices escalate to anywhere near like the collector car industry has, has been. So I think by not driving it, you're going to lose the opportunity to to have fun with the car and then someday when you decide to sell it find that it really isn't is worth that much more than you thought it was going to be in, in the range of a rare type car kind of going off of the the storing it not driving it does it hurt it in the selling price of it to if you're storing it for so long and then all of a sudden you start seeing leaks and, and issues and stuff like that. And I'm assuming that that's why it really should be driven more. So when you do go and sell it, you're not going to come up with those issues. That's exactly true. And again, there's people who have cars that they've stored for many, many years. And you can still, you can still find them once in a while, come up on a dealer's lot with the, you know 500 miles or 1,000 miles on them that have been stored for a long period of time. And a lot of times they'll tell you, oh yeah, we've changed the uh, transmission fluid, we've changed the brake fluid, we've changed the coolant fluid, you know, you run, you know, turn it on and run it for time. So you have to question, did they really do all of that? Same thing of a personal uh, sale from somebody who claims that they've done all of that. Um, I had an example that in I, uh, about 1996, I bought a 88 GT uh, that had been stored in a plastic bubble since it was bought brand new by this particular person. He had never done anything to it and it had 700 miles on it and I did buy that car from him and fortunately um, all the fluids got changed and, and it ran fine and didn't have any of those leak issues but I've heard many cases where a car is set around for years and all of a sudden he started up and all the seals and gaskets and, and everything who have shrunk all of a sudden start developing leaks so it's not a good idea I mean, certainly you can say have a car sit around for six months or, or even more, and it won't be that much of a problem. But if it sits around for much longer than that, you're going to have out, you're going to have these dried out seals. So it's not a good mm -hmm. idea. If nothing else, you take it out and drive it, you know, a couple times a year, maybe you put, you know, 15, 20, 30 miles on it on the highway, and, and that'll keep things going. You, you even have your air, air conditioning compressor seals in the same kind of situation. Okay. What, um, I know some people kind of get this confused too. What's the difference between looking at the price guide and seeing what that, are these, would you consider these retails, resale pricing or definitely not trade-in pricing, but what would you say looking at the price guide versus having it appraised? Well, first of all, the price guide um, pretty much the way I've set that up is probably about the price that they end up selling for, not what they're advertised for. In all cases, uh, and I was just looking recently again at about 20 ferals that are advertised in various parts of the country by personal sales on Penox, um, in a couple of the club magazines, and I was looking at the prices and they're kind of all over the board. So the, the key here is that I'm trying to give some, the word guide is the most important part of the whole Fero price guide is just a guide to give you some ideas of where the pricing may be at final sell, not it's what's being advertised. And if, if you have a professional appraiser come out and appraise a car, as a general rule, you will probably get a higher retail market dealership level value, which probably will be higher than the price guide because the price guide, again, is a selling price. 
in the in the true market. So that's that's probably the basic difference. Well, it's good to know, and and I hope um, everybody, you know, kind of sees that and 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 kind of uses that as a good reference point too. Are you looking for that special personalized gift for someone? Bonter Solutions can help you find that one-of-a-kind gift. Anything from t-shirts, sweatshirts, drinkware, signs, decorative items, holiday items, and so much more. They can design pretty much anything you want on them, from pictures of your car, your favorite sports team, a pet, or any saying that you want. The list is endless. Minimums are just one of each of any item, and the best thing is, they do not charge a setup fee. You can catch Bonter Solutions at several Fiero and Pontiac events in the area. Fiorama, the Dells Run, the 40th anniversary show coming up in a couple years, and the 2021 Indian Uprising All Pontiac Show. So, feel free to visit their website at bontergifts.web.com or give them a call at 847-453-3290. You can also email them at bonnie at bontersolutions.com. We also have promotional item products that they offer as well. That website is bontersolutions.com. Um, what is the difference between, so not only do you do the price guide, but you also have a nice write-up that, that tells you the difference between your classifications of what fair, what's average, and what's excellent. Can you run through that real quick? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, going back at the guide, and uh, one of the articles I've written as part of the values is that the price guide can easily move 25 to 50% from the value shown in the guide. And, and that becomes down to condition. And uh, I have three conditions, a, a fair, an average, and an excellent condition on the car. And so I um, actually show all that uh, and, then, and go into some length about what I consider a, a fair value. Uh, and fair means that it's probably got some defects. It, it still runs, um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the car. Uh, maybe replace tires, air conditioning may, may not work. Uh, might need exhaust, exhaust work. There could be some leaks. Uh, brake, brakes could be bad. Tires could be bad. So, uh, and there could be some real rust in the car. And you know, as you well know, that uh, rust is a real enemy of the Fiero, despite the fact that we mm -hmm. have some plastic type panels that uh, the under rust in the, in the frame doesn't go away because it's a Fiero. And we've seen a lot, a lot of rust in the rear uh, trunk areas over the suspension system. So a lot of that is almost non-fixable without major repairs. So, I start off with a fair value that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's probably wrong with the car, but it probably still runs. And if I move up to average condition, um, it's probably got only minor problems. There's no major mechanical problems. Uh, should be minimum rust. Uh, maybe the air conditioning doesn't work, but the air conditioning is all there. The belts are there, the compressors are there, and uh, nothing, parts aren't missing. <coughs> it may need some suspension components, but it's still, you know, kind of an, so average, an average Fiero that someone would look at and buy and probably have to put some time and money into it to really bring it up to uh, an excellent condition. So, and then I, I go into the excellent category and this is a car that's in good mechanical condition. Uh, the engine compartment's clean. It's, nothing is leaking, leaking all over the place. I can't find much rust underneath as in the surface rust, tires and, are, are still good. The, the wheels all match. They're the original wheels. You know, emergency brake works and, and things like that. And plus, hopefully, you get some documented um, maintenance records are available for the car. So um, those are the three categories that uh, I, I defined as you know, what I consider under those three categories. Okay. I'm going to throw another curveball here. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Nick DeMonte's car. So he did a, correct me if I'm wrong, he did a full restoration, correct? So he took yes. it down to the actual frame. Does, is that something that you would consider in excellent condition 
or is that something where that would just have to be a personal preference on on what that selling price would be because it is a restored Fiero? Yeah, there's a case where, you know, as I mentioned in the price guide that uh, some of these prices can translate into 50% difference in the values. And in his particular car, it's almost like buying a, a new car. So uh, there, there's not a category for the kind of car that he has. Um, the category is above excellent and like new and even, um, I don't remember how many miles in the cast on that car, but no matter the mileage, he's replaced most all the components, rebuilt the engine, done everything else to the car. So it's like new. So that would, that car, you know, would again fall into the category of someone who wants a, a really, really great beer and is willing to pay extra for it. And that puts that car into a category that's worth considerably more than even the excellent value. Okay. You have a nice breakdown of the years and models. Um, are the numbers based on the number? Are your numbers based on the numbers produced? Does that play a factor into what the cost is? Uh, no, uh, it's strictly based upon what the values are in the marketplace. So it doesn't really, because a car only had, it was only, let's say, 4,000 1986 SE four cylinders built does not put it in the category of it should be worth a lot more because it has low volume. Uh, so I've, I've tried to keep that particular item away from the values and trying to just categorize it by the conditions of the car and what they are in fact selling for in the marketplace. Okay. Does the, do you, have you seen that base price change year to year or is it somewhere it, it, it fluctuates maybe every other year? Uh, what do you mean by the price? So you're, if you if you have kind of what you started with back in, in 96 and use that as your baseline, do you see the change? Do you change it yearly? Or I mean, let's see. Do you see a change yearly to where you have to update it yearly? Or is it something where you see it fluctuate where it doesn't move for a couple of years? Well, each year, each year I look at the prices and probably each year I change at least a dozen prices. And I do change some of the mileage adjustments based upon the values that they're being sold for. So yeah, every year, there are a few cars in there that probably haven't changed. Most of those are in the, the, the uh, basic coupe four cylinders, which really don't change much over the years and as a matter of fact they're becoming harder harder to find because so many have ended up in the junkyard because once they start having problems with a, a 85 four-cylinder coupe there's probably not a lot of people who are going to spend a lot of money to rehab the car and, and get it back up to an excellent category so the answer is i do change it uh, i look at them every year and I, i'm looking back and probably making 10 to a dozen or 15 changes every year to the guy. Right. Uh, um, you have also on the, on the price guide, a few options listed. Do, do other options such as interior style, wheels, stereo, et cetera, stuff like that affect the cost as well? Or are these options that you have listed, those are, are the main ones that drive the price to either be steady or decline or increase? Yeah, my opinion is the, the, the six or so items that I have listed are probably the options that people look for on a car. Um, there were a few style or wheel options um, in all of those years, uh, you know, except for the stereo upgrade, which I haven't included on here. Um, there weren't a lot of other options other than what I've listened to, the power mirrors, the sunroof, and power door locks, power windows, T-tops, and, and, and a wing. Those are kind of the major options that were offered in all the years you know, along most categories. But um, I see no reason to add you know, a lot of other options that, because there weren't that many more to add. There were no real wheel options until you moved into a different category from a coupe to a sport coupe to an SE. It, it, the wheels that came with the car, you didn't usually have too many options that came with the car 
as the, from the base car. So the only other thing I probably haven't put in here is uh, the stereo upgrade. Of course, the leather interior in 88, there were so few made that putting that in there, I, th I think we're just, it's just going to increase the number of, of columns in the chart, which is not really going to change it that much. Okay. Um, as far as um, the mileage selection goes on the chart, you only have it go to 150, but we're seeing a lot more of, of the Fieros that are still on the road are getting up into that 200,000 range. Anything over 150, does that consist into a negative number? Or would think, you still... Yeah, I, think, I think once you get to 150 and you start going up from there, it's, it's all down to a matter of condition of the car. I mean, I have seen cars with 200,000 miles on them that really, really look nice. So it's pretty hard to put a, another category of 160 to one or 150 to 180. Uh, there's, there's certainly some of those cars out there, but I don't think enough to create a category with a price determination for over 150. Over 150, I think it boils down to a, a buyer on you know what he sees in the car and the way it's been maintained over the years. Okay. Um. Hey, hey, yeah. Can I go to our next question? Okay. Um, have you seen a lot of the higher mileage cars in that average to excellent condition then? Well, if you say how many, I mean, again, looking online is pretty difficult. You know, somebody's advertising a car for at 180,000 miles and they have four pictures. And, you know, and they want a premium price for it, and they claim it's in wonderful condition. But until somebody does an inspection of that car, I think I lost you. Paul? Uh, I think I lost here. you on I can that. See yeah. Okay. okay. Can you still? Yep, I can, I can hear you now. Oh, All right, okay. so let's go back and redo that question. Okay, so the cars that are in that 200,000 range, do you see them being more in an average, fair, or, or excellent condition? Well, if you see cars advertised in that upper range, uh, somebody will post four pictures and they look good from the outside. And many times you got to remember that when they get in that category over the years, they might have been repainted. It depends on where they came from. You know, if they came from the West Coast or Southwest, there's bound to be a lot less rust damage. If they came from the Northern states, um, there's likely to be more under uh, carriage rust on those cars. If they came from Florida, there's likely to be all kinds of uh, sun damage to the interior. So it depends on where it comes from. And again, high mileage cars, yes, I have seen some that have been well taken care of, well maintained, and I've seen some that are just finally at the end of the line and somebody just wants to get rid of them. You know, I've seen some advertised, some GTs advertised for, you know, under a thousand dollars. It's even got a lot of miles. Yeah, but it's got, you know, all these things wrong with it, but I'm just trying to get rid of it. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of that that still goes on. Do you think, um, and I'm just asking your opinion on this. Do you think a lot of people like to see the reviews and see how the price changes year to year? Well, I hope so. You know, there's been occasional discussion about the price guide uh, on, on the internet. And there's some people who said, yeah, you know, you know, I bought a car and I actually bought it at a lower price than this. And some people say by having a price guide like this, it drives down the price of the Fieros, to, you know, let the market go where it may. Well, the price guide, you know, doesn't, force the market to do anything. All it is is a guide for buyers and sellers to see where they start and based upon the condition of the car and what they have to offer, they can price it however they want. And as you well know, most people advertise a car at whatever price, there's always some negotiating left. And the question is how much is left to negotiate those cars? If somebody were to see the price guide and they were a first time buyer and they went to a dealership and could they use this as a reference point or is the they, dealer kind of like the 
say all end all kind of this is the price well just like everything else so sure, they, they can take this price guide and guide in as a secondary item this price guide has been used for insurance purposes um, with um, uh, accidents that have total cars too but yes the answer to your question is they could take it and say listen here's a, a national price guide that's been put out for a number of years and like, here's what they they think this car is worth and let's say that the, let's say it's a car uh, an ADA GT priced at 10,000 on the lot and the price guide based upon the mileage says the car should be worth eight thousand dollars and uh, I, I would hope that the price guide could offer them some bargaining power by showing a sales uh, manager or salesman that this is maybe all the car is really worth so this is what I'm willing to offer you and and, and you know what a dealer will say, um, you got money today, we're ready to go. <laughs> Do you, um, again, kind of going back to when you're putting all this together. Do, so you got the different auctions. You've got eBay and you've got your big Mecham and your, your Barrett Jackson auctions. Do you think that the bigger auction houses skew those numbers? Or do you think that those are the rarity numbers that we'll probably never see again when a Fiero sells? Well, I've seen a lot of Fieros come across the auction block. And um, there's some that have sold at higher prices. And I think, you know, sometimes during an auction, you can get pretty excited about something. And I think a lot of people do and uh, do spend or pay more for a car. And, you know, as you know, there's a lot of cost in selling and buying a car at auction. So that all has to be factored into what those prices are showing and what they're listed for. So uh, I, I think some of the auction prices have been higher than what I anticipated that they would be. But if somebody's willing to pay the price, um, it's what the buyer really wants and let the buyer you know, pay that kind of money for it. Do you see like when some of these cars go across the auction block and say they, they they reach a ten thousand, fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollar price tag. Do you think people see that and say, "Well, my car is just as good. I'm going to put it out there for fifteen, twenty thousand. And then you have somebody that comes with this price guide and say, "Hey, dude, you're crazy." <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, same same thing again. This, the price guide is based on a lot of history over a number of years watching these prices. So, yeah, they could say that that they saw this eighty six GT just sell for ten thousand dollars, and based upon my price guide, it should be uh, fifty nine hundred. So, um, and, and that's fine. And that again, whoever bought that car um, or saw that car being sold at that kind of price, you know, would certainly want to reconsider what they're buying and, and the quality of the car and what, what kind of condition it's in. Have you seen, or is there any way to kind of gauge the number of Fieros that are left? And do you think later on that that would also kind of, kind of play a factor in what the cost of the Fieros could be later on down the road as fewer and fewer are on the road? Yes, I agree with that. And the question is, nobody's been able to really come up with a number of heroes left on the market. Um, there have been some estimates that were made. I think I even saw one as low as 37,000 not too long ago. Um, the only real way to find out how many heroes are still out there is there, there is a system in the car, in the automobile manufacturers group, where you can go into each state and pull up registrations for um, cars that are specifically Fieros. And I don't know that that's ever been done. The only problem with that is those are all the Fieros that are registered. How about all the Fieros that are sitting in people's garages that are undergoing some sort of a rehab that are not registered? You would never find all those cars. Uh, my personal estimate is that there's probably somewhere between, oh, 70 to 90,000 Fieros still out there. Now that's out of 370,000. I can tell you over the years I have seen and heard about so many Fieros go into the junkyards that it, it wouldn't surprise me if the numbers are that low. Wow. That's that. Yeah. Just to think so about the question, that. So the yeah. question is, so the question is, will that drive prices? In some cases, it, it will as time goes on, as we see the market and the prices on cars being sold start to go up. 
specifically, again, on the more desirable cars, not so much the sport coupes, but on desirable cars and the GTs and even the SEs and the Formula and even the 88 sport coupe. So some of those will continue, I think, start continue to rise where the other ones, uh, I, I don't see them, no matter what the number of cars left, will ever really go up much in value. You actually bring up a good point about desirable. Have you seen just over the years, you know, and, and just general question here, the most desirable, a pure, non-touched Fiero, a restored, or a modified to a V8? What would you say, in your opinion, is the most desirable Fiero out there right now? I still have to say a stock Fiero is still... People still talk about buying and, and um, rehabbing a stock hero to make it look like original factory. And um, there's still a lot of people who like that idea. I mean, obviously there's a lot of people that want to modify it, you know, put different engines in them and things like that. But I still think the desirability, if you ask a, a true hero um, aficionado or what he would like to have, he'd say, I'd like to have a own stock hero. Yeah. Well, I, I've seen them and if I could go back in time, I probably would not have, um, modified or customized mine. And, but I like the customization and, but again, my, I, everything on my car, the drivetrain is still all original too. So, um, Going into well, the you've couple, done, you've, you've, oh. you've, you've, you've done to your car what you think you'd like to have and how you enjoy it. And, yeah. and that's what all Fiero people ought to do when they buy a Fiero is, you know, you're not, you're, you're not modifying or customizing a real high, high value uh, car of any sort. You're, you're modifying or, or customizing a, a fun car that you enjoy driving, enjoy mm -hmm. being seen in and, and be out on the road and, and like what you're doing. Yeah. And, and I, you know, when I first got the car, I, you know, feel, well, you know, how long am I going to keep this? You know, am I going to kind of get bored of it? Because when I was just out of high school, when I bought mine, and to me, when I saw it, it you know, it, it was a cool sports car. And I figured, okay, well, I'll keep it for a couple of years and I'll trade it in. But I started tweaking stuff and, you know, customizing it and it just kind of every year I would do something different and, and yeah, you, you, you kind of put your own personal touch into it. So, and that's what kind of makes it hard to sell is you're, you put so much of your own blood into that car. You don't want to sell it because it's, it's almost like a part of you now. So, um, a couple final questions. Uh, if you were to look back at the very first price guide that you published and now would you see a big difference in the prices um yeah you would see some but not as much as you might think uh actually probably the prices have gone up in my price guide over the years so um, um i think you'd probably see some differences and i plan on putting together a, a price guide, um, a kind of a history of prices and, and all the cars and what I did. I just haven't got around to doing that yet. But uh, again, we're just we're re trying to reflect what the current trend is on cars that are available to be sold today. That's the whole idea of the price guide. Yeah. And I, yeah. I can't emphasize enough the word guide because I've had people say, well, here's the exact price it should be based upon your guide. And there, there are too many other factors, including what we just talked about, desirability, that mm -hmm. come into play. Do you see yourself continuing to update the price guide? Or have you kind of come to the point where you've put as much into this as you can, and I would like to maybe turn it over to somebody else to continue it from years to come? Or... Is there a formula that you use for, you know, to kind of help guide the guide in future issues? 
there is no formula. And the answer to your question, the, the, the formula is watching the marketplace. And the answer to your question is, you know, if there's somebody that is really into this pricing scenario and, and watching it closer than what I'm able to do uh, today, then I'm, oh, I'd love to have somebody just kind of pick up on this and maybe come up with a new look on it, uh, a new way of determining prices in the marketplace. That would be wonderful. And I'd be more than happy to work with somebody to transition to that kind of a change. Yeah, maybe this will, you know, kind of uh, persuade somebody to step forward because I mean, everything that you've said and that we've talked about, I mean, it sounds like it's it's a pretty easy document to update as long as you watch the market. Yes. Right. All right. Well, we hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of FiroCast and, and kind of got a little um, background on what the Firo price guide really is and, and, and how it works. So... Um, Again, uh, thank you, Paul, for joining me today. And I, I hope that everybody kind of, again, has a good idea on, on how this how the price guide works. And you can always find uh, a copy of the price guide on Fear of Focus. It is under, um, yeah, actually, where is that located? <laughs> uh, I think it's on the, the, the homepage of the uh, fearoffocus.com. If you scroll down, um, it's uh, yes, it is on the it's a 84 to 88 for your price guide tab just under Paul's product reviews. So you could find both those right there on the home page. Um, yeah. And, and on the price guide, my name, address and phone number and email is on that guide. Or anybody's always welcome to contact me um, in any way they'd like to. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that I might have on pricing with your all right. Well, thank you. That's that, that probably helps out a lot too. So, all right. Well, okay. uh, thank you again. And okay, um, thanks Mike. Yep. And appreciate uh, the time. We appreciate the time and hope that somebody will get uh, some benefit from this. Yes. Yes, I do too. And, uh, it's always good, uh, talking about fears too. So, um, <laughs> again, right. uh, thank you to, uh, Bonter Solutions, the Fero store and Rodney Dickman, uh, for uh, this episode's uh, uh, sponsors. Uh, Fear of Focus Magazine, again, you can find all this information in there and our two Facebook pages. So if you have any uh, information or ideas on future casts, you can email me at mkroyer at fearoffocus.com. And uh, again, we've got a, a good list and... Uh, uh, it's turned into a monthly podcast instead of a, uh, a, a winter podcast. So I'm very excited about that. And we've got a lot, uh, lot to talk about in the future. So again, thank you, Paul. And uh, uh, thank you to everybody listening. Have a good night and keep fearing. <laughs>